Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to this ArcuWare webinar uh, titled Backup and Archive of GB Lab Storage with ArcuWare P5. This is David Fox speaking on the left hand side there and uh, waving. I think you should be able to see me. And with me, I've got Duncan Beatty from GB Labs. Hi, Duncan. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Yeah, my afternoon for most people, I think. Um, right. So let's let's kick off and um, have a look at what we're going to cover. Before that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're recording this webinar, so we'll make the recording available uh, via <clears throat> ArcuWare's YouTube channel. So everybody that's registered will send you the link to that, plus a link to the slides to the email address that you use to register. And um, we're using GoToWebinar. There's a questions box, and we will welcome uh, a 10-minute Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if there's anything specifically that we're not covering that you'd like answered, um, type in your succinct question into the box, and we will read all of those out, and uh, depending on who's best answering, either myself or Duncan will answer your questions at the end. Um, the webinar is um, scheduled to be 40 minutes. Uh, we're going to do about 10 minutes of demo, 10 minutes of questions, and uh, 10 minutes each of discussing, talking about our respective products to kick off with. So um, let's begin. So we're going to start with an overview of GB Labs and uh, the products that they sell. Uh, beginning with Duncan, and then we'll switch to me to talk a little bit about P5, and then we'll team up to show you this stuff live. So, Duncan, over to you with an overview of GB Labs. Lovely. Thank you very much, David. Um, so, for those of you who <coughs> do not know who we are, I thought there's a little bit of history about GB Labs and where well, we've just come gonna, from. Just to uh, interrupt, I think we said we'd turn our cameras off so people have got a bit more screen space to see the slides and the demo. Okay. So, I'll just switch mine off. So sorry to interrupt. Back to you, Duncan. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, a little bit about GB Labs and what we do. Um, so we were established in 2000, <clears throat> and since 2000, we've been creating some really interesting products for sort of multimedia um, and the media industry. Uh, but then in 2007, we realised that there was a, a bit of a, a probably an issue in the market that there wasn't really a a well-priced, high-performance. Um, sensible storage solution other than SAN on the market. So we introduced and we brought um, network attached storage into the media market in 2009. And this is incredibly fast, um, very stable, um, and really very, very cost effective for a lot of people, a lot less management required, and a lot easier to use. Um, so since the, then, just to interrupt, the main point about that, isn't it, is that you could just use Ethernet basically basically in a switch to connect yeah. your workstations to the storage, so you didn't need to put fiber channel cards in in your IMAX or whatever you're using for editing, it becomes much more uh, easy to roll out. Well, yeah, um, and in fact, you could use IMAX because you didn't need a fiber card, and that was kind of one of the major benefits at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot more flexibility. Um, and since then, we've grown in our products and grown in our software and become one of the, the global leaders in our um, scalable storage and shared storage. Um, we're known for our products being safe, secure, reliable, and incredibly fast. Um, and that's really key. Um, in the media environment, you have to be able to provide that performance. It's not generic IT NAS. Um, and I came from an IT-based DTP background before video. Um, so I understand um, and I've discovered the nuances of video and what we have in our industry. And so we are predominantly for media production and post-production. Um, when I see media production, that could be anywhere in corporates, within design houses, within um, fashion houses, uh, anywhere particularly that use corporates. We've got our products on, on oil rigs in the North Sea. We've got them in um, weapons establishments. We've got them in medical banking. They're all over the place because yeah. the media departments are, are very similar within those departments. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put, I'll put you on the next slide. Yeah, next slide. Excellent. So um, to explain how we work, so our products are a network server, and at the heart of it is our Core 4 OS, so version 4 at the moment. Um, it's got some incredibly good tools. You'll be seeing a little bit of it later as we do a quick demo, so you'll be able to see what it actually looks like. This runs on the server, and it's embedded inside the server, and you manage it through a web GUI. As that product has grown, we've got lots of different sharing protocols. We've got automated tools. We've got um, 
you know, watch holders and all sorts of things. But we've also introduced some very, very specific tools like our Unify Hub, which is that non-premise and cloud integration. So we've got remote workers working at home um, as if they're in the office um, alongside people in the office. So it's very, very, very seamless experience. Um, we have Mosaic, which is a, a sort of uh, an introduction to MAM is probably the best way to put it. It's like a, an asset organizer. So it allows you to see your files on there, play clip previews and things. And as you start to in, understand that this is a really interesting way of managing your media, you can then branch out to full blown MAM systems later on. And just another example of kind of things that we have is our dynamic bandwidth. Um, so we have a way of controlling who has access to what on the storage, not only by um, access credentials, but also by performance um, and dynamic performance. So we can change the performance that people receive dependent on certain rules. So priority rules, depending on which projects they're working on, they always go to the top of the queue. Okay. So CoreOS is, is running on the servers and it's got some really unique tools inside it. Um, so the bandwidth, bandwidth control would allow you to to identify users that are doing 4K editing or something like that and say these these are the people that need to have the highest priority and everybody else can suffer a little bit in order to allow them to not drop frames in their, in their editor and so on. Well, yes, you can do, but above that, it actually prioritizes the most important people. So you might have four or five people on the network that are not doing 4K, but they are on an incredibly important project. Mm -hmm. So they will get priority above other users, even though other users may be 4K editors. Okay, I so see. So it's about the priority of the most important systems on the network, as opposed to just, oh, look, then we need to reserve the bandwidth for that guy using 4K because we reserve it, most people reserve it the whole time. So you lose yeah. that performance Yeah. because you're always keeping it available, whereas we adjust to who's the most busy. Okay. Interesting stuff. We always do things a little bit differently at TV Labs. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Right, um, next slide. Yeah, so the products. So uh, briefly on the product range, so we have two kind of um, slightly different ranges. We have our Space Echo Vault, or SEV as we call it. And these are, uh, for example, space highly scalable storage with both HDD, um, all SSD, or a hybrid with hyperspace, which is like a, an accelerator for the most busy work. Um, they're very expandable, very fast, very flexible. Um, they have the complete tool set. And they're aimed towards the power users, right? Proper power users, you know, perhaps post-production, movie production, animation studios, um, and people sort of 40, 50 machines. Uh, and then we have Echo, and Echo is our range of, of near lines. Um, so for us, a near line is taking a copy of your, your most important work on your, your space system, perhaps. If something goes wrong, you need to be able to jump on that second system and continue working. And it's important that we have a product like that. And a lot of our customers um, use our Echo products. In fact, some people use Echo with perhaps an Avid system or a SAN, where they're online because they have that already, but they still employ our Echo system alongside it. And as you'll see later, the great news is that we can put the ArcuWare plugin um, inside the Echo as well as the space system. So whatever storage products you have of ours, you can still use it with ArcuWare, which is great. Mm -hmm. And then we have our, our approach to LTO archive and backup. Um, our approach is much like what we do for, for a lot of our systems. It's very simple, it's clean, it's incredibly high speed. We can saturate all four tape drives at the same time. Um, we have a little tool called HyperWrite, which allows us to write any file of any size at full speed, which is incredibly important in media. As you're chunking way through a big long form video clip, big, big file, and you hit a load of audio, they're tiny files, we can just carry on at full speed. Um, so it's a really interesting product but um, it's designed to be very easy to use um, inside the studio. So next slide, please. There you go. And to sit alongside that, then for media production, which is the other side of, of, of production industry, where you've got the corporates, you've got the on-premise, perhaps, um, you've got the small media houses, up to 20 systems. Uh, we've got our desktop and rack mount fastness solutions. Uh, they've got built-in NVMe for um, acceleration, like a junior version of the big products we have called Hyperspace. We've got a very specialist software RAID that's incredibly fast. And the Blue Shift is our technology we use for network acceleration. So these products really sit alongside the, the Space Echo Vault. They all work together. They all talk to each other. They all use the same software. Um, 
Fastnet as a slightly um, light version of the software called Core 4 Lite, um, but very easy to use and very easy to manage. And as I said before, can all take the P5. Yep. So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so why are we talking here with, with Archiware? Well, we have our own data tools inside the system. So we can replicate data, we can snapshot data, we have our file manager allowing you to manually or schedulely copying files in between our storage systems. We have automation with watch folders, so we can take a folder uh, on some storage, we can watch it, and we can push files and action them and rename them and move them around, perhaps to other storage, other servers, other NAS systems, or the cloud. Um, we can also push and pull from the cloud as well, so we have a great cloud tools in there. So why are we partnering with Archiware when it looks like we have everything that we need? Well, Archiware offers on top of this some really great, great tools which David will go through. So there's a lot more flexibility um, within that. So they have support, I'm not going to with Thunder, but they have support for lots of devices we don't, for, for Tape, for example. Um, and there's things like the, the V5 Synchronize um, archive and the containers as well, which is a little different to how we do it. So with the two, sets of tools, you can have a really, really flexible, and very powerful workflow. Uh, 11 minutes, that's my bit done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <clears throat> well done on the timing. Uh, thanks, Duncan. So I'm just going to talk a little bit now about uh, ArchiWare P5, because we appreciate some some of you on this webinar will be familiar with GB Labs or be familiar with ArchiWare P5, but maybe not the other product and certainly not maybe the integration, the way that the two can work together. So let's just take a little look at the ArchiWare product suite. Um, we are a software only product, so you can purchase us and install us wherever you want us to run. And um, in this presentation, we're going to briefly look at P5 Backup, P5 Archive, and P5 Synchronize. So these are three of the four in total modules that uh, comprise ArchiWare P5, and each does a different thing. So P5 Backup does exactly what you would think. It, it gives you a, a disaster recovery position so that you can recover data in the case of a disaster. Um, P5 Archive is different. It's, a backup does put your data into the cloud or onto tape or into a in, onto a disk, but it does it for a particular purpose, which is if you have a disaster, you can get that data back. Archiving is different, and I'm, I'm stressing that a little bit in the next slide as well. Archive is about deliberately choosing certain pieces of data, certain projects, and migrating those off of your expensive uh, <coughs> live storage, somewhere cheaper, somewhere more secure, maybe somewhere geographically different from your main uh, location. So that's P5 Archive. Um, P5 Synchronize is about replicating data between one disk array and another disk array. So that could be between two space devices or between a space box uh, and uh, a fast NAS, or between um, some GB Lab storage and just a cheap, uh, consumer NAS or some SSDs inside of your Mac that can basically replicate wherever you want it to go. So just banging home that backup versus archive uh, lesson that we always like to talk about. Backup is a copy of your data uh, over here on the left hand side. In fact, let me see if I can just use the highlighter here. No, that's the wrong one. The, uh, the spotlight, that's what I want. So yeah, backup is a copy of the data for DR purposes, generally it's going to run every day because you want to make sure your backup is always updated with the files that have changed in the last 24 hours. And everybody needs a backup, and so probably everybody on this webinar has a backup of some sort. But archive is different. So archive is where you're moving data so that you're not filling up that primary expensive storage with projects that have long since been completed. So it allows you to uh, take that completed work and take it offline, and it runs as needed. So unlike a backup, the archive process is probably requires human intervention to determine what it is that you want to actually archive, which projects are complete. It takes somebody knowledgeable about the data to make that selection. And media and broadcast companies, they need an archive. You have lots of um, fresh data arriving with new pieces of project work. And on the other hand, you've got outgoing completed projects that you don't need to be committing full time to your costly storage. So um, I think I have to switch off the pointer to get to the next slide. So uh, yes, USB disks are not an archive. A lot of people that we that we speak to have this issue where they've been buying lots of cheap storage um, and yeah. that's their archive. And we just wanted to drive home the fact that it's not reliable, redundant, it's not off-site, you can't search it, and it simply isn't a prof professional solution. So you could take those disks, you could pull them back onto your online storage 
and then maybe employ something like an RQRP5 archive workflow to make that into a professional workflow that is searchable, where you get off-site copies of the data and redundancy, and generally you get the reliability that you need from an archive should you come to need to recover work that's some years old. So, it's um, so important, isn't it, David? Yeah. So that, to understand that understanding of the difference between backup and archive is so is so key, really, to, to people's workflow. Yeah. I mean, hopefully that hopefully that's clear for everybody on the webinar. But mm. if if anybody isn't clear, then please um, t please ask a question in the box about about what what else you need to, uh, or or how it maybe applies to your business in a way that you need, needs a bit more explanation. So on yeah, this, they look like they run the same way. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So on this slide, I've just, uh, similar to a slide that Duncan had a minute ago, actually. Let me try and get the red blob. There it is. So we've got some uh, GB Lab storage sitting on a LAN of some sort where we can have a P5 server running independently. So although the space box is run P5 and it's pre-installed, it just needs activating. If you're looking to um, do a fairly heavy duty workflow you really want to have p5 running on a separate host which could be a windows a linux or a mac machine in the case of the demo we'll show you in a minute it's a mac and then from there you can back up an archive to one of these three different types of storage so you can go to disk storage and this could be as i said earlier a cheap nas just a, an array of disks connected all we need is a folder to target our backup or archive data and in that folder, we create what we call a virtual tape library. So we create some container files that we put your data into, and that makes us very fast in the case of backing up or archiving lots of small files. Then we have our very well-known LTO tape support, where we, we support tape libraries of any size from any vendor, or we support standalone drives for the smaller installations. And we also support use of multiple drives spinning at the same time to get much much better throughput so you could have four lto9 tapes spinning to get potentially three times 300 megabytes a second of throughput for your backup and archive providing that your source storage can run at those speeds and in testing we found that gb lab storage can and then at the bottom we have cloud storage where we're able to take your backup or archive data and put it in a cloud bucket of your choice in fact i think on my next slide i just need to get back to the pointer on the next slide I've got these three different types of storage so I've got disk top right the LTO tape um, compatibility uh, bottom right and on the left the public cloud uh, services that we support include Amazon's s3 including Glacier and uh, the Snowball devices uh, Microsoft's Azure Backblaze Wasabi uh, anything compatible with the a3 uh, protocol sorry s3 protocol which is what most of these cloud services have standardized mm -hmm. So yeah, storage options for backup and archive are all of those. Uh, with particular emphasis, still a lot of our customers are still using LTO tape, um, LTO nine being the latest generation uh, with uh, sixteen. Uh, what's the what's the capacity of an LTO nine tape? It's, it was twelve for LTO eight, and then we add another six to get to 18 terabytes on an LTO9 yeah. tape. So it didn't double, it added another 50% of the previous generation. But still an, a massive amount of uh, capacity that you can get on a single tape. And then if you've got a tape library with 25 slots, you've got a huge uh, capacity for archive and backup. So before we go into the demo and show you a bit more detail, I just wanted to show you a window, which is what you'd be looking at when you're using the P5 archive product and you're browsing <coughs> media files that have previously been archived now exist either on tape or in the cloud or on disk. And we allow you to browse a directory hierarchy that matches the one that you originally archived from. You can search there at the top and then at the bottom you get a list of archive files. You can see thumbnails that we create and playable proxies of media files. So these are files that may be on tape, but you can still see and play back a portion of the file and even view captured metadata and search on that metadata before you decide what it is that you need to recover back to your live storage to make a new revision of that product, project or whatever. So this is all uh, happening in our web interface. Uh, same place that you configure the product is where you go and actually drive it and recover stuff back uh, out of your archive. So uh, with that, I'm just going to flick desktops over to this one. So this is a, uh, we're looking at a Mac Mini here, which is actually uh, where Duncan 
is in uh, you're in Reading, aren't you, Duncan, in the UK? Yes. Yep. So yeah, uh, actually, uh, in our office, yeah. Yep. So Duncan, if you want to just give us a quick spin round the uh, the the core uh, U, UI for the operating system, and then uh, we'll, we'll yeah, I thought I'd just um, thank you, David. Yeah, I thought I'd just go for a, a very quick look at um, uh, the, how we service the data and how we support the data and how we share it. The reason is because um, looking at the demonstration slightly later on with the Arcubo product, you'll understand where the data is coming from, what we're looking at. So this is uh, logged into one of our systems here. Um, we've also got the networking and the disk sections and things. Um, but what we're looking at is actually the workspaces. And the workspaces are the shares on the storage. So we've created a share on the storage called Archiware. Um, we can see it in here. It's on our sharing system. We've got SMB and AFP running and uh, web browsing running as well. So we can see the files that are in there. And as a local machine, to be able to mount this, it's very simple clicking the path here. And we're going to copy that, click over to the finder, paste it in, and connect to the share. So just a normal share, exactly as you'd expect. So these are the files on the desktop that you can see here. Now, these are the same files that David will be showing you later on in the Archiware interface. So you can see where these files are actually coming from. So this is our core four. Um, Archiware is one of our new tools. So as we go down to the Tools menu, you go into here we can head into our new system menu and see the integrations so aside from the other integrations we've got like mosaic and compliance and monitoring and unify hub and things like that inside here uh, we've got the client arcura integration so this is built into every single box um, this can be activated within the system you can start the service and that means an arcura server can then reach out to our storage and take data from it and that's important to know, there's no extra installation required, it's built into the OS. This is running the very latest version, version 706 of Arcuware on our latest version of our OS, which is 4.33. And we can see here the options that we've got, the groups, the users, we can choose which port number to access. And in here, <coughs> excuse me, we've got the tools. So we can edit the integration, we can start it up or stop it. We can actually turn it off by uninstalling and it will then that service inside the box and uninstall it and stop it. Auto start will allow the integration to start up. So as soon as you start the server, it will start up as well. So that data that we're looking at, this SMB share on the network, is where we'll take that from, where data where David will look at that data from the other side of it. Uh, we've also got lots of monitoring in here as well. So we can go into our analytics and have a look and see what's being pulled from the data. And we've got our dynamic bandwidth as well. So we can choose, perhaps we can put these systems down into medium or higher priority. So it may be that we can put uh, the Archiware server on a medium priority. So we know that once it's connected, it's always going to get some priority over other users. So that's our side of it. I mean, if you'd like to see more of the software, we'd love to show you. Um, it's got lots and lots of tools within it. Um, but I'm going to switch over to David now so he can look at the, the Archiware side. Thanks, Doug. Good. So another browser window, another another web-driven, web interface-driven product. Um, <clears throat> so this is P5's uh, kind of dashboard, which is expired. So let me just log back in. OK, so uh, you see the four modules across the top in this interface. Uh, so there's the backup that we discussed, archive, synchronize for replication. And the module I didn't discuss in the uh, slides is backup to go, which is a workstation backup. So you could use this to back up workstations, but we won't cover that as part of the uh, the webinar today. So I want to focus uh, for the next couple of minutes on Archive. Now, um, the Archive module um, has something called uh, sources for data. And under here, we have clients where we have our GB Labs box configured. So hooking up P5 running on this Mac Mini across the Ethernet network to the P5 uh, client that's pre-installed on the GB Labs box just involves adding one of these clients, getting the IP address and the authentication information correct and the port number that P5 is listening on. And then uh, that gives you full access to the file systems on this, in this case, space box. So that means that if I go to, uh, if I want to do some manual archiving, I can then see the file system that the space has shared out. I can, for example, see that Archiware folder, and you'll see that that matches 
what we saw in the finder. So this is a live view within our interface of the of some of the storage on the, on the space because you might want to then archive or back up some of this data and you can select it directly within our product. So um, for the purposes of uh, our demo, the target for any data that we're archiving is simply a local folder on this Mac, but we could just as easily be configuring um, a cloud service from one of those that we support so that you could then be targeting your archive data into a Backblaze B2 bucket, for example, or we could be adding a tape drive by um, using our new tape drive wizard, which will detect any tape hardware attached to this host, or indeed tape libraries, where you can add both multiple tape drives inside the library and support for all the slots and the barcode readers and everything that a tape library provides is all supported within uh, within this product. And with the version six from about a year ago, we now support LTFS uh, tape formats for archiving so that you can get data onto LTF to <coughs> LTO tapes in a vendor neutral format so that those tapes can be read outside of ArchiWare. You could send them to another partner and they could easily read the contents of those tapes using any LTFS compatible software. Um, now in my demo, I've set up what we call an archive plan. So this is a configuration within P5 that determines how we will be doing archiving. And I just briefly wanted to show you a couple of options in here. We have something called auto archive which will archive a set of directories from the space box on a schedule. So we could say every day, every weekday at a specific time, look in a particular folder where users will be placing completed project work that can then be archived. And then we will automatically archive from that folder. And we can even optionally delete the archive files once they've been successfully archived to the, uh, to the tape or the cloud or the disk storage. And then over here we have previews. So this is where thumbnails and proxies that you saw in the earlier screen grab can be configured. So we can capture uh, thumbnails from any media file, but we can also use FFmpeg to make a small proxy file from any media file, including audio. So we recently had a customer that was archiving audio files and we were allowing a low quality playback of some of those audio files within our interface so that you could choose what you were going to recover. And then we allow metadata capture. So I've not configured this for this demo, but we can look inside the media files that you're archiving, extract things like uh, codecs uh, or camera models, and then include that in our index. So when I say include in our index, I'm talking about the mechanism by which you restore files that you have previously archived. So if I go into archive here, you can see we created a space archive and this contains various folders from the uh, space storage, including the Arch ArchiWare folder. So again, now you can see those files that were, I'm just gonna stop that because it's um, making a noise. You can see uh, those movie files that we archived previously, a couple of days back from the space storage. Um, once they're archived, the, we, we capture this preview. We also capture metadata. So we've captured the encoder used to create this file across some of these uh, some of these clips. And if I double click on one of these um, clips, P5, oops, again, I need to silence the video. P5 will um, show us the, the playable proxy, but it will also give us a list of, the, of the, um, the particular times and dates that this file was archived. And it will tell us the, the volume that they were archived to, whether that's a VTL volume on a disk in this case, or a specific tape volume or some cloud storage. So you can archive a file multiple times and we will track the storage that that file was archived to. We have the playable thumbnails and previews and we have the metadata. And you can configure this database to capture whichever metadata fields you're interested in, whichever ones are gonna be useful in your workflow. And you can also search. So uh, where, where we've got some ProRes files, I could do a search on encoder uh, contains the string and put some pause in and we should be able to find those files well they briefly popped up and then they disappeared no, it's the demo let's click back to start with again it's the demo monkeys at work isn't it duncan they're always yeah yeah but um it's back to um, contains with yeah 
Well, this was this was working, but because we're showing it to lots of people, it's not working. But uh, there you go. It should it should find the matching files by searching in the metadata. So that's our interface for determining uh, what you want to recover. So you can imagine after a year of archiving stuff, you'll have a vast database with many thousands of files. The ability to search across that database, across all of the storage that you've been archiving to, if you have 100 tapes, then you don't have to think about which tape something might be on. You simply come into this interface, find and search or browse for the files you're interested in. And when you come to recover a file, P5 will tell you uh, which tape the file is on. It knows when it was last archived, where, that, where that's been stored. So you don't have to think in terms of tapes. Uh, or whatever storage you've been archiving to, P5 keeps track of all of that for you. Right, so um, I'm over time already, but very briefly, um, what I want to do is just show you our replication tool, which is called P5 Synchronize. And here, Synchronize is very simple because it's simply copying from one source folder or folders to a destination. So in this instance here, we've got our Archiware folder on the shared storage on the space box. We are copying, replicating that to a folder on the desktop, which is actually just sitting up here on the Mac. And we have a schedule for that to happen where at a minute to midnight every weekday, it will do an update of that folder. It will discover what's changed on the source and copy changed files across to the destination whilst keeping previous file versions for any files that are changing. So we can track file versions, or in another way of using uh, Synchronize, we can create entire snapshots. <coughs> Excuse me, my, my voice gets progressively more croaky. Um, so we can create snapshots or versions. In this instance, we've elected to create versions. So you can see here locally on the Mac, we have a copy of each of those movie files that we discussed earlier. But because one or two of these files has been changing, on a, uh, as somebody's been editing it, uh, we've kept we've kept previous versions of that file uh, in this versions folder, and then we have a workflow where you can tidy this folder up so you're not having to store too much additional data. Um, lots of options going with P5 synchronized between uh, capturing a history of versions and also capturing snapshots of the entire file system, and we also support uh, snapshot file systems such as ZFS to uh, to maintain those snapshots. So um, that's my fairly quick tour of P5. And just to give you an idea of the way that some of these archive and replication tools can augment um, the, the, the stuff that's already available in GB Labs products to give you slightly more control over your archive uh, workflows. I have not shown you backup because uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but backup works in a similar way to archive insofar as everything is indexed into that database. So when you want to recover something from a backup, it's a very simple process to do that. Okay, so um, I think that wraps up our demos. If that's okay with you, Duncan, we will go back to here. So just a couple of slides to um, to point you to a URL for Archiware where you can grab a trial version. Um, Archiware, we're very responsive. So if you want to ask further questions via email or get yourself hooked up with an evaluation license, then you're very welcome to get in touch or to just grab something from the website. Uh, GB Labs are at the URL there, which you probably could have guessed. And so that gets us to questions. So at this point, I'm going to go and have a look to see what we've got. So yeah, we've been typing in a few questions as we've been going along. So let's just go through them. I'll read them out and then uh, we'll, one of us will answer. So the first question from class, uh, how does RQWare P5 handle image sequences? Each image file an entry or one entry per sequence. Yes, I'm familiar with this um, this way of storing uh, video. In fact, what's the file extension where, there, where there's lots of separate frames? Um, DPX. DPX. Normally the DPX one. Yeah, DPX was on yeah. my tongue. So yeah, we will archive DPX. In fact, we have plenty of customers that are doing that. Um, the way that we handle the target storage is we're not trying to write each file onto the target storage when archiving as an individual file, which means that we're much quicker, for example, if you're going to tape or to cloud. Um, so we can write them fine. Um, the index will, uh, will show you a folder with a large number of files inside. We do have a customer that um, 
configured the preview generation, I believe, to work with a um, with FFmpeg so that it would generate a proxy by reading all of the DPX files. It could be a bit time consuming, but if you want a playable proxy within P5's interface, then ping me an email because I can hook you up with um, another customer that got that working. So hopefully that answers your question, Klaus. Uh, question from Peter. Let me just scroll to the top. Uh, Peter says, I'm looking at migrating to GB Labs, that's good news, fast NAS for production with uh, local NAS for replication. Want to archive to Google Cloud. Does P5 provide the same content functionality in Google Cloud as with LTO? That's a really simple answer. The, it's, it's yes. So the way that we work with LTO, and it sounds like you may be familiar with archiving to LTO, MP5 already, the workflow is identical when using Google Cloud. So you create the Google Cloud uh, bucket and uh, point P5 at it via the, the, the credentials that you need to attach to that bucket. And then we'll basically create what we call a storage container, which is just a big elastic uh, piece of storage that we create inside of your bucket that you can just go adding to over time. So yeah, Peter, it's, um, it's identical way to use uh, use that functionality. Okay, next question. Oh, can, got... I just add can I just add yeah. something on that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Peter, and there's also the aspect of utilizing the tools to help you get to the new storage as well. So if you're looking at our product, um, our own tools can help you migrate your existing data onto our storage so that your downtime is very minimalized. Um, and if you have a P5 server sat alongside both our storage and your existing one, um, it can help manage not only the near line aspect, so you've got that second copy, but it can also then take from that other storage system during the day and push up to cloud, so it doesn't tax your online storage as well. So, um, yeah, with the two products side by side, you could get a very nice, clean, tidy workflow. Yeah, actually, I'm just thinking one of the nice things about using P5 to help a customer migrate to different storage is that you can you can leave use you don't have to disconnect all of your users from all of the storage whilst you do the big copy which might take mm -hmm. a couple of days so you can leave users accessing the old storage as it were whilst a uh, a replication runs and begins and completes the copy across to the new storage but only at that point when everything more or less is copied do you need to get the users off the old storage then you would run that yeah. replication once more and then it will pick up any last minute changes that people were making whilst the first copy was taking place and at that point your new storage is completely up to date you can switch off the old storage and connect people to the new storage with, with hardly any downtime so tools like mm -hmm. these are really useful to save a lot of time which means money in in cases like this that's okay. expensive yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it would uh, it would be a lot of people sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Okay, we've got a question from <laughs> Mohammed. Um, he says, I already have GB Lab storage. Good for you. How do I go about adding RQWeb P5 archive to what I already have? Okay, so um, that would be uh, a case of simply um, employing another host machine, so Windows, Linux, or a Mac, or even a, a some some other kind of NAS device. Uh, that that host will be the thing which accesses the target storage. So you would either connect your tape hardware to it or attach that to the cloud bucket. And then you simply hook up that P5 installation with the space operating system in the way that we showed you a little earlier. Um, and then you can begin archiving from the GB Lab storage. Do you think there's any more nuance to that question that I'm missing, Duncan? Um, the only thing I would say is that the GB Lab storage would need to be running core four. So if you are on a version three of our storage, um, core three, then you would need to potentially upgrade. But if you're already on core four, you'd need an update to get the latest version of the P5 integration um, package okay. into it. So the P5 integration is part of the core four OS, but not, not the older OS. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Um, question from Jason. I've already got some brackets non-media storage using RQware for backup. How would this integrate with what we already have? Um, I've already got some non-media storage, so I assume that means slower storage. Um, don't know. Probably, probably talking about sort of more generic IT storage rather than media-focused storage, yeah. Yeah, okay. 
So uh, how would you integrate this with what you already have? Well, you could use that. Um, you could use that slower storage as a target for uh, archive data. I mean, you could target yeah. use to using a backup, using an archive, or using replication to get like a file and folder replication onto that slower storage. So it really would be, you know, you can integrate in various different ways. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. I would say. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean. I suppose from our point of view, it would be to install a lovely new GB Lab storage to be your fast storage. Um, yeah. And then the P5 can then see both existing systems and the old systems, and you can archive them from both. You can restore to both. Um, so there would be very little difference in your workflow. Um, and as David mentioned earlier, it can help you migrate from one storage to the other as well. Yeah. Um, as all the tools we have. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, there's one follow-up question from Peter who asked the one of the earlier questions. Most of the content is on HDDs. Okay, Peter. So, um, yeah, you could archive f your content from your hard drives to the Google Cloud service. That's not a problem at all. Right. We did. There are some more questions on the thing here, but um, I'm conscious that we said this would be a 40-minute webinar, and we're already a mm. minute over. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks ever so much, Duncan, for joining me. And uh, okay, no problem. We'll, uh, this webinar will run again at 6 p.m. for people in time zones other than uh, the European ones. Um, so if you want to send your friends and colleagues to, to watch that, that's great. Otherwise, we'll send you a copy of the recording and the slides. And uh, thanks for coming. Hope to see you in the next webinar. Cheers. Thanks, Duncan. Okay. And one last thing is that um, the people that the questions we didn't get to, we'll, uh, we can respond to those anyway and just answer what you've got um, offline. Yeah, indeed we will. Okay, thanks Wonderful. again. Cheers.